again. Okay, I'm not sure if the people online heard something. We didn't hear anything anymore in the room, um, but I guess we can imagine what the sounds of nature are. Um, we can maybe play this video after without all the technical uh, challenges so that you guys have the sounds in, uh, in the Marka hub. But we're also lucky, lucky to have someone with sound with us who's gonna uh, share something about the forests, how we, view its values and how we, we use it. Uh, we're very lucky to have um, Mikael uh, Suya Bolustat with us. He's a biologist, a writer, uh, a photographer, and um, a speaker. And he has uh, experience and is specialized in nature, the environment, and outdoor life. And he will take us a bit deeper into the forest. Uh, so give a big hand to uh, Mikael. Do you have sound uh, in your no. presentation? Just me. Good. Um, first call me. Yeah. Just this place. Here you go. Right. The floor is yours. Cool. Thanks. Hello. Uh, pleased to be here. Um, my name is uh, Mikkel Soya Bölstad. Um, I uh, I'm a biologist. I'm also a writer, and um, a uh, book review once called me a professional vagabond, a professional utevigger in Norwegian. And you guys wondered what I was doing. Um, so my work is basically to plan trips, go out in the field in a tent or fine and whatnot, and uh, photograph, take notes, go back home, write, and then. Repeat. And sometimes I get to talk to people um, like this. Um, I am not really supposed to be here. On Monday, I'm supposed to hand in a book manuscript. So I'm not even halfway. <laughs> but, uh, I just, this sounded so interesting that I just couldn't uh, help myself. So, uh, so I'm the one, the curious one here. Um, I've also got a bit of a sore throat. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. And that's another important aspect. I, I don't consider myself an expert. I know a little bit about a lot of things, but uh, I'm not sort of a super trained uh, professor in ecology or forest ecology. I've been working a bit with uh, forest and forest ecology for a number of years, um, but I wouldn't consider myself an expert on forest. Lots of people know way more than forest than, than me. This is my, uh, what do you call that in the, uh, English? Uh, um, my family station car. I don't have a driver's license uh, when we bring the dog along and go like this. Here I am at work, I'm preparing a speak or talk. Um, uh, actually, the day after I, I gave a talk that I prepared. Oh, can I stop this sort of also thingy? 
because I think this changes, or maybe it doesn't. No, I probably just uh, touch the touch panel. Right, so so here I am uh, on my way at work, and um, just to sort of uh, uh, um, make you realize I'm totally uh, um, biased. Ike uh, Imhabil, as you would say in Norwegian. I love <laughs> camping under old uh, uh, pine trees like this in old world forests. Um, but I'll try to be as objective as I can during the talk. So, um, yeah. Of course, uh, I planned this to use my iPad. So all the fonts are, of course, gone. Normally, I I, I make the fonts on a uh, yeah. Never mind. Um, <laughs> I just didn't have the time to do it in the in the foolproof way where you just get the font in the image baked in. But so so everything is a bit strange. But I think I think we managed to understand what this is about. So the talk is to see the forest for the trees. Um, we'll see about that. In Norway. We consider ourselves maybe i don't know necessarily mountain people but mountains do get a lot of attention in norway and this is a famous painting by Harald solbad so it's a national treasure called winter nights in the rondana and everybody looks at the mountains but i look at the forest so uh this was 100 years ago uh, a bit more than years ago. uh it's a little bit difficult to see here but we can see that the pine trees are a bit crooked and bent so we can see that there are dead trees standing and lying about uh, so that silhouette there trying to sort of bake that into your mind and keep it there, there just a few moments and then we'll go back to that later um a few years not just a few years ago, like seven eight years ago um i decided to write a book about the norwegian forest uh, I'm not going to go into detail why and how and all of that, but I decided to um, do that. And uh, during the research, I found out that there was this area up in a place called Fehmun. That's about 400 kilometers from where I live in Kongsberg. I don't know, almost 300 kilometers from where we are now, I suppose. And um, it's a very big uh, lake there. And on the eastern shore, uh, there was this area where you had old growth forest. Um, the forest was uh, more or less pristine. It hadn't been, uh, hadn't really met a saw or an ax. And um, some of the trees were like 500 years old, maybe even 600 years old, and it was not protected. And even if it was, uh, it was on, on state property, it was not protected. It was actually started to be clear cuts on the eastern part, I mean, western part of the forest. And uh, as a responsible father, of course, that winter holiday, when I found out this, I brought, decided to bring my daughters to this forest called Sorkbula to, to see it before it maybe got chopped down. So I uh, know we don't have a car, so we jumped on the train with our skis and polkas and whatnot, uh, backpacks, and took the train to Drammen where we changed uh, uh, to a train going to Harmai, where we changed again and got to Elrum, and then we <laughs> changed the bus and we got to Trisil. And then on the last bus, it went dark going up uh, Engerdal, and uh, it was dark when we got to Femen, Femen Tuna, the night. And this uh, bus driver, it was winter, he felt sorry for us. We were allowed to come into his little warming hut where he sort of, uh, waited until he was going to return down the valley. And then we um, got picked up by a, a cab driver. And uh, I didn't exactly know where we were going. <laughs> or, uh, there wasn't, I mean, there wasn't any sort of um, uh, route we could follow. We just had to follow our own route. So after 10 kilometers in the middle of nowhere, I said, OK, this is it. We're going off here. And she looked a bit of <laughs> all at me and wondered what I was, uh, what I was knowing what I was doing. And, um, that I hadn't lost my marbles or anything. So she uh, sat us off uh, on, uh, at the edge of the road there and we waved goodbye and, and it looked more or less like this or this. And um, then we started walking. And after a few days, um, the forest sort of had started to become a little bit more interesting. We weren't uh, near sort of the most pristine areas uh, yet, but I thought, well, oh, the forest looks sort of pretty nice. So I asked my daughters that were like 12 and 15 years old at that time, what they thought of the forest. And the oldest daughter, she said, uh, yeah, I don't know. 
it's nice. It's like, it's forest. And um, she was 15 and I thought she looked a little bit cheeky and uh, maybe a little glint in her eye there. So she might have been pulling my leg. But um, I think many of us might just say that and say, yeah, it's forest, isn't it? Um, and not really sort of thinking much about it. If you go on social media, Instagram, for instance, you can see pictures like this with a hashtag gone school or old growth forest. And this is a plantation that is maybe 40, 30 years old. I don't know. Uh, Man-made forest or this. This is a little bit older. But um, as you can see, all the trees are the same age. So this area has been clear cut at one point and then um, planted. And uh, the trees are maybe about 50 years old, 60 years old. There's a roundabout what we can see around here if you go down to the road. And again, uh, this is, uh, they've used the hashtag Gumbu School here. And here we are, <laughs> also a very, very young plantation, about 30, 40 years old probably closer to 30, but there's a bit of ferns, isn't there? There's a bit of moss, so it's got to be old. So this person have uh, used the hashtag pristine forest, and this forest never has been uh, touched by humans. Um, and I'm not out, uh, I'm not sort of trying to mock people here, but this is a sign that we are starting to forget what a genuine forest looks like. I mean, if you think this is the way a natural forest looks like, then we've lost something. And uh, yeah, lots of examples. Oh, what's the moss? Must be old. The truth is that it's so dense, this forest, that there's hardly any sun reaching down there. So it's basically just moss that can grow there. Can look nice if you like that, but I mean, if you all the forests look like this, then yeah. Um, we'll get into this. Yeah, go on. And um, this is uh, from Uflimarka, a commercial for. Uh, um, what do you call that in English? Uh, short travel, uh, wilderness experience. It's, uh, and again, this is much to do with wilderness. This is also just a uh, planted forest. All the trees are more or less the same age. It's at that far right corner. And we can go on. This is a, a, a um, well-known Norwegian producer of uh, outdoor equipment. We don't need to say who it is. But I mean, if you are the sort of type that really, really don't want to hear birdsong, when you wake up in the morning, you should go here. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> and we can, yeah, we can, we can go back to that. Um, so what is happening is that slowly um, the forestry is changing our forests. It's been changing for, for 500 years. We're gonna come back to that, but it goes very slowly. And when these changes go very slowly, we don't really, um, we're not really aware of them. So uh, this is a, a, a um, phenomenon called shifting baselines. It's, it came from the fishing industries uh, or, or fishing uh, science way back. But the concept is, is very simple. I mean, for each generation, we, we sort of have a baseline. When I grew up, I grew up with a forest looking in a particular way. And then when my kids grow up, they have another baseline that I have because the forests have changed. And for each new generation, we lose track of what a forest looks like. It might not matter, <laughs> but anyways, yeah, we can go on. So um, after a couple more days, we come into the inner part of Circle Run, and we have uh, found ourselves a nice tree uh, to sleep under. I'm not sure how old that tree is, but uh, 400 years plus, maybe even 500. And then I asked my daughter again, what do you think of the forest now? And then my oldest daughter said, wow, this is fantastic. It's like sort of a sculpture park or sort of every tree is different. So the tall trees and small trees and high uh, fat trees and dead trees and they're lying down and you've got all sorts of shapes. And you remember that silhouette that uh, Harald Sur painting Winter Night in Lombana? So you can see here. So it might have been an axe here at one point. There might have been a saw, but it's so far back in time that the forests do look like a pristine forest. Yeah. 
wow, that was service. I actually remember to put the, <laughs> the painting in there. Right, let's go back in time to the Ice Age. Sometimes I like to ride back to the Ice Age. Um, so 10,000 years ago, if we travel back in time, Norway would look sort of more or less like this, like covered in snow and ice. So when that melted, uh, vegetation slowly came back. And uh, after a while, we um, got forests. And uh, this is actually a, a small remnant of old growth oak forests. Norway had lots of oak forests at one point, but that's just um, been felled. So uh, we hardly have anything left. But this was be sort of an, a, a typical uh, forest in Norway 500 years back, 400 years back in some areas. That is more or less a thing of the past. Um, yeah, and then the pine trees came uh, about 2,000 years ago. And uh, the first people of Norway, yeah, what you could say is that the, the forest in Norway is pretty young. I mean, it's just been there since the Ice Age. But the forest ecosystem, with all the species, I mean, they've developed through thousands and thousands of years. So the, the forest ecosystem is old, even though the forest itself hasn't been there for that long. That makes sense. Now, the first people who came here, this is actually south of Kongsberg, where I, uh, where I live. Um, the first people who uh, came to, um, to Norway, they didn't really bother much with the forests. They were hunters, gatherers, fishermen, and uh, they don't, didn't really need forests for more than maybe making shelters and, and some, some fire. So they didn't really do much. Um, and then, of course, you had agriculture after a few thousand years. So in the, in the bottom of the valleys, it started to use the forest more and clear um, the landscape. But it wasn't until this thing here came to Norway that things started to happen. And that's called the gate saw of Gangsag. Um, and this um, contraption here made it possible to saw uh, timber much more effectively than what you otherwise could have done. And uh, so this was like in the 1500s, 500 years ago. And that was sort of the start of the uh, Norway's sort of first industrial uh, adventure or adventure endeavor, or whatever you call it in English. So, uh, so this was extremely important for Norwegian economy. And um, yeah, so they, so basically that sort of contraption uh, uh, was taken into use all along the coastline and also then further inland. And uh, over the next few hundred years, the forest was more or less um, chopped down all over Norway. So if we uh, look here now in the 1500s, the dark green color is sort of a pristine, virgin, primeval forest. You like it's a forest that hasn't really been used by humans. On the top bit, light green is what we have felled. Now, 100 years later, not much have happened, but then things speed up. And uh, by the turn of, yeah, like 120 years ago, we hardly have any pristine forest left. You know, we call that school in that way. You know, that can speak Norwegian. And this is probably a bit exaggerated, it's a bit fascinating, it's quite just to be able to show it. So we basically don't have any primeval pristine forest in Norway. But is it, we actually never sort of mapped it completely. We don't even really know, but we know that it's roundabouts sort of down here. The rest has been felt. So if we are a little bit less sort of uh, stringent or whatever you call it in English, uh, sort of you say that, okay, let's include forests that has been felled at one point maybe, but it's not that, um, hasn't been that intensively um, managed. So it still maybe resembles a pristine forest a little bit. Well, then 1.7% of the Norwegian forest has a, is a, what you call a natural forest. It looks like more or less still here. So the forest we walk around in here in, in Nuremberg, except for a few places, Opkuven, for instance, uh, further west, or Spall and Kaffmosa, there are some small pockets of forest there that resemble um, pristine forests in this category here. The rest is actually managed 
forest, and pretty high. So you, you hardly find uh, old trees. And the big paradox is that if you look outside, it's on the pine trees around the hut here. They have been allowed to grow because people thought they were pretty. So look at the uh, branches on the trees sat there, the pine trees. They're fat, and the branches are hanging down. The tree trunk is fat, the bark is scaly, and all these are signs that this is an old tree. I don't sort of, I, let's say 160, 70, 180, maybe even 200 years for some of the oldest trees here. You don't find that in the Norwegian forest or in other places, really. Just a few select places. I'm lucky I'm living in Kongsberg, we actually have quite a few of these. Uh, but enough of that. So uh, 100 years ago, uh, 1916, a forest professor, professor in sort of forestry, um, um, he, uh, he uh, sounded the alarm and said, we don't do anything now. We don't really have any forests to, to, uh, to use or utilize later on. We were worried that we, uh, we overexploited the region forests. So what, what I've, they've been doing for years is that they took out sort of trees here and there, selective logging. They took out the biggest ones. Then when they're taking the biggest ones, they went down in size and took the second biggest one. And then they went on like this until we just had these sort of thin, scraggly uh, trees left. So a lot of the forest in Norway, not everywhere, but a lot of places, maybe most places, looks a bit like this. Um, he was a bit of a cool cat because he wanted, he, he said that we shouldn't really have forestry sort of against, we shouldn't work against nature, we should work with nature. So he was actually advocating a sort of forestry that is um, that, that's, um, some of the environmental organization advocate now. Uh, selective logging, but in a way that, um, I say, uh, uh, oh, I'm losing the word here, but the, sort of, uh, that the forest still will look a little bit natural, to put it that way. You still have some ecological processes going on that you will have in a genuine Christian forest. But he didn't uh, win that argument, so there was a bit of an argument and uh, back and forth. So instead, um, the school of thought that meant that we should just clear fell everything and then plant new trees. That was sort of the rational way of doing things. So from uh, sort of uh, the mid, uh, middle of last century, that was sort of the method of doing things. And you started to plant trees. And actually, if I'd been younger, and I was younger in the 50s or 60s, I might have been taken out of school and uh, gone out to plant forests. So a lot of the uh, uh, forests we see out there now is actually planted, maybe not a lot, but, <laughs> but some of it was that they planted by school children. I mean, it was sort of, um, so, so all the forests you see around the huts here, more or less, uh, at, at least the one that looks very homogeneous, if you go a bit sort of down that direction, I think it is, uh, where the road is, and this, and this trail, you can see a bit of forest like that. As this is planted forest, that had been clear cut at one point, and then brought up like that. Uh, yeah, I can't remember, the proportion of forest subjected to clear cuts, yeah. So, before you sort of took out, you know, it might be look like, maybe I look like a logger, I don't know. You went out and you sort of chopped down the tree, First, you used axes and then you started using saws, and you took out sort of select trees. And then from the 1940s, you, you stopped doing that, more or less. So now you took away all the trees. Uh, so um, here we've got some sort of pristine <laughs> forest down here. This is the forest that has been uh, logged with the old method of selective logging, and the top bit is clear cut. So by uh, 40 years later, Mid uh, or in the 1980s, you can see the proportion that has been clear fell has increased tremendously. And then 2020, we're down here, and you can see where this is going. It's sort of got a major decline. So uh, I try to be a bit artistic. I always get a bit embarrassed. Uh, and this is a good time to say that I'm not really against uh, forestry. I mean, I live in a tree house, I love tree, I love tree furniture. I love tree artwork. So we need some sort of forestry. So it's not about that. It's more about maybe how we do things. So as I said, I'm not completely neutral here. <laughs> but oops, uh, what I tried to visualize is how modern forestry with clear cuts would feel like for species that are dependent on forests 
that are more natural. Right. So what is happening? I'm going to try to illustrate is that um, this is not maybe quite right. Maybe somewhere between two thirds and three fourths of the forest have a clear cut. Um, so we came up with some new new figures that are a little bit lower than this, but it's a few years ago, and you know <laughs> the development is very speedy. So, so maybe in a couple of years' time, this these figures are actually right on the money. So, but what happens is that the forest gets very uniform, and I don't know what some of you uh, that live in or that we get um, the forestry industry to say that we get more old growth forest, and that sounds really weird. Have you heard that? Yeah, well, that's a um, uh, institute of uh, bioeconomics. We do, they are very good at it. They're right selling us that we get more overall forest. And that sounds really weird when I stand here and say that we clear cut more and more forests. But what is happening is that in the old time, when people look like this and chop down trees, they chop down trees everywhere, all the time. Not necessarily all the trees, but you, they're spread out everywhere. But nowadays, you don't really uh, fell the forest until you get there with your forest uh, entrepreneur, your machinery. So that means that a lot of forests are just standing there, <laughs> waiting <laughs> to be clear cut. And so until they get clear cut, it's very fonder, just like uh, you and I. Each year we get older. But uh, <laughs> never mind. So, so that means that this forest here, some of it might grow old enough to be categorized as old growth forest. The problem is just that we're eating into it like that. So at one point, a few years time, that will so we won't get anything else. Enough of that. So what's the problem then? Okay, that's a pine tree. The problem is that this is just like the first stage of a pine tree's life. Now, the tree you can see out there, big fat, uh, nice uh, pine tree, that has allowed to grow a bit bigger, but it could probably stand there for twice as long. I mean, right, that could probably get 350 years old, maybe even older, but the trees aren't allowed to get that old. So if I'm a species that need this sort of tree to, um, to live, then I'm in trouble. Um, and what about the species that need Old trees that are dying, or dying or dead, um, they also have trouble because the trees aren't allowed to get old enough to die. So we are missing these two stages of the uh, tree's life in uh, a lot of the forests you see around there. So it's not a nice forest, it's nice to walk in, but biologically, it's not that interesting for a lot of species. So this means that about 1,330 forest species are on the national red list, and about 84% of them are dependent on old growth forests. This is actually, a, I don't know whether you say lichen or lichen. Is there any English? You say, you say lichen? Lichen, right. It's a gnarl. Uh, this is called Greek gnarl. I don't know, yellow spotted uh, lichen. I don't know. This is actually a rainforest species. We've got rainforest on the coast of Norway. Not tropical, but temperate, and also boreal uh, rainforests. And we have all. I mean, we are. Norway has actually um, some uh, uh, art or not art <laughs> species assemblages that are so special that it's actually got Norwegian name. Trøndelag elementer. It's like sort of the Trøndelag yes, uh, species conglomerate or something like that. So we've almost chopped all of it down. It's just uh, just. Few, few tiny little spots left. So species like these are almost extinct from Norway now. We haven't managed to sort of uh, take um, to protect them. Okay, uh, I know. I don't know about time, but so just have to stop me. <laughs> but uh, so the problem is, of course, that lots of species are dependent on old uh, trees like this. Um, this is like sort of a, a a huge sort of food parcel for lots of species. So they, their life is dependent on uh, devouring that and breaking it down, decomposing that tree. It's just, it's full of energy. Um, yeah. So uh, for a lot of species, this would be sort of, sort of uh, 
the best, the very best. Um, mm. But I can't go into detail there. So, but I think I just uh, I thought I'd maybe take you to a buffet. I've just been eating. I don't know you about you, but um, I'm because I'm a bit boring now because uh, I'm sort of more or less uh, vegetarian. Not maybe a hundred percent. So I think that's called flexitarian or something. I'm not quite sure, but <laughs> but a uh, few years back at least, when I got to a buffet, I could start at one end and I could just eat my way through, and then start on the other side. I eat my way back, and then it comes in like that. I could eat everything. Um, so in sort of uh, biological terms, I would be considered a generalist. Nothing special about me. I could eat anything, but some might be more specialized. Maybe they only eat sort of uh, Chinese spring rolls. You might not find them everywhere. So you're lucky if you have them there. But if you don't, well then there's no, nothing for you in my buffet. You're a specialist, right? And the thing is that lots of the Uh, is it just me or everybody else is? No, I lost it too. I lost the audio. Okay. I think we lost everything. I think they're just reconnecting. Um, yeah, it's frozen, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. And it's appropriate for a talk about forests in the frozen north. Yeah, I think they will reconnect in a second. It's very symbolic. Get frozen from this reality now. Yeah. They are frozen or we are frozen? Right. It must be them because uh, we're all here. Yeah, I am um, like Evan. We haven't heard from Evan or who is who is playing. How do you feel about this yes. presentation? Ah, maybe it's connecting. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll need to share again. All right. Sorry about that. I think, yeah. Yes. Maybe go back to Nah, just so um, we could talk a lot about these different species that are specialist uh, um, species. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, but that's not uh, really um, uh, the important message here. Um, yeah. Uh, we also don't want to skip that. It's not that important. Uh, we understand that. So uh, the forest industry, they try to protect the forest on, and the species that were leased by setting aside something called forest uh, key habitats or something like that. They're tiny, tiny, tiny. And each color represents a different uh, sort of habitat type. Red is old forest. Uh, brown is sort of uh, cancerous rich areas and so forth. And this is a bit problematic if you are a species that are dependent on one of these type of habitats. So we're not going to talk about extinction rebellion, but we're going to talk very shortly about something called extinction threshold. And um, we have to go a little bit into something called vaccines. And you're probably fed up with that after Corona and whatnot. Um, if round about 97, to 92% of the population has taken the measles vaccine, measling. Um, then you've got group immunity. 
And it depends a bit on how close uh, people are living together. So if you imagine that we are a town now, we're pretty close together. So what we need to do is to make sure that the virus can't spread from one person to another in this densely populated town, right? So we might have to go up to 97%. So you are the habitat of the virus. Are you, can you see where this is going? So when we vaccinate, what we are trying to do is to make uh, ourselves inhabitable for the virus. The virus can't live in us. So what we basically do is, uh, I mean, I mean, each virus has its threshold for when it cannot spread in a population. And there's the same uh, principle for species out there. The more fragmented the landscape is, the further apart the different landscape elements are, the smaller they are, the more difficult it is for the species to spread and reproduce. And each species have their threshold, their threshold for what they sort of can, can manage. So that's the big problem we have now that we fragmentate the forest to such a degree that the species have difficulties having viable populations. I have a species here that just shows that we're actually in a stronghold of this uh, species uh, in uh, in um, in Luimarka. And the interesting thing is that it's a species that lives in forests or it needs forests that that doesn't have to be pristine, but it has to sort of have lots of the elements in a pristine forest. Old trees, big trees. Yeah, we won't go into detail about that. Here's a woodpecker, white back woodpecker. That used to be more or less as common as the great spotted woodpecker, frog spets in Norway. Um, yeah, and that, um, sorry, I didn't get to translate. So nowadays we find that uh, in the Western part of Norway. Um, and it's not on the red list. It was at one point, but now it, it actually manages to survive in the Western side. But it was actually very, very hot here. In Sweden, it's almost extinct now. It's like a couple of birds left. And what is happening is that this bird is dependent on deciduous forest, low school. And it eats insects and larvas all year round. So if there's not enough dead trees with enough insects and insect larvas, well, they can't get, can't find its food. So this is a species that tells us that if that species is present, it's sort of like an umbrella species. If that is present, well, then there's lots of other species there too. Um, so it does actually matter. It's not like say, hey, we got the great spotted woodpecker. It looks all, it looks almost the same. <laughs> That's the common frog species that all of us know about. Um, and the big, big paradox is you can't really see it now, but there's a, uh, a, um, a um, woodpecker called uh, tree toad woodpecker over there. And uh, that likes, uh, spruce forest, but that's actually on the red list now. Even though we have converted a lot of all our deciduous forests to um, spruce trees, that's why the white back woodpecker is gone. Um, um, the tree toad woodpecker is uh, on the red list now because it needs old world forest. So, yeah, there we go. Let's go into what's probably more interesting for you. Um, Ecosystem services. Five minutes. Wonderful. Um, when I was studying biology, in, uh, we're going to go back to Sorkula, well, by the way, that forest, so that's why we are a bit of a rush. We, we've got 400 kilometers to travel, or 300 from here. Um, when I was studying biology, uh, someone uh, came up with something called, I was back in sort of around late 90s, early 2000s, um, something called ecosystem services. And it was biologists who thought, Hey, all these economists, they don't give a damn about nature. We have to sort of, we have to make them understand that nature is valuable. We need nature. So what they came up with is um, different sorts of um, services that nature gives us. For instance, I'm not sure what happened there. Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> that's the fault. But anyways, provisioning services, that could be drinking water, timber, food, stuff like that. Then you also have regulating services, the ecosystems, they filter water, we've got pollination, decomposition, erosion and flood control. Forests are important in 
uh, in, for instance, um, by reducing erosion. And it's also important in flood control. Then you've got cultural services. I mean, a lot of us think that that pine tree out in the middle here is nice to look at. All right. And then you've got supporting services. All the processes need to keep the ecosystems functioning. And uh, some people say that this is very anthropocentric. This is sort of centered around human needs, but I'm not quite sort of, I would say that you could argue that most species out there are dependent on well-functioning ecosystems. So it's more what we make of it. So I think it was brilliant. We tried to highlight that nature is actually important for us. Problem is that then you started to use an economic language and try to put a monetary price on nature. And how do you do that? How do you, how do you compare the cultural, the, I mean, the value of cultural services compared to regulating services or the most common provisioning services? And I'm gonna come back to that. We're gonna bugger that. And we're gonna go back to soil cooler. Um, very, very nice forest. 500 years old, uh, some of it, maybe even 600 years old. But I would like to cut down the trees so I can say, hey, the value of the timber is so and so. So, what can I do? Yeah, I can say that, well, uh, I'm just going to go through here. We have a bit, <laughs> a bit of a rush. I would say, argue that the value of that forest, to me, the cultural value is this and this. The problem is that most often that argument. Um, it's very difficult to put value of something. So when we try to use an economic language, we often lose out. Um, then I could say that, okay, uh, this is um, uh, uh, taxus baccata. I think is it called tax uh, barlin in English? I don't know. But I mean, a lot of uh, the organisms out there in nature has properties that we need. 50% of the enzymes we use in the industry is from uh, nature. So I could say, hey, there's lots of undiscovered goods out there. I'm being very anthropocentric, of course. Then I might win someone over and we will leave that for us, but maybe that's not enough. Uh, yeah, here are some of the red list species. They're not everywhere. So you could potentially maybe, if you sort of forget about all I said about fragmentation and stuff, some would argue that, I mean, as long as we don't sort of cut down the trees where these species are, we're all good. Because you aren't. But, um, what about if I was a landowner and land owner and I said that I could build huts here? What is the property value there? Of course, it's millions of krona. And then I could come around and say, hey, you know, the cultural value of me sleeping in a tent under that old growth tree is this and this. So it doesn't add up. <laughs> so the forest would def definitely go away. In the, um, I've got to maybe got one or two minutes. So I'll just I think I'll just round off. In uh, the forest industry, they have uh, uh, forest certificates and uh, environmental standards. And in that standard, it says that in areas that are important for outdoor life, they should try to avoid using clear cuts if, if it's economically viable. <laughs> right. So this is 150 meters away from where I live, old growth forest. We have, uh, or should I say, had right out our doorstep. Um, this is also um, considered or categorized as um, the highest category of importance regarding outdoor life in uh, what's it called? Uh, the Environmental Bureau. No, we do not have to do that. So it's, I mean, it is really, really important. <laughs> but unfortunately, <laughs> it wasn't economically viable. So they took everything. Um, so this just goes to show that uh, ecosystem services are interesting. There's a good way of highlighting the importance of the different services that nature gives us, but we really have to be careful to start to use an economic language uh, in this, because I would argue though that the value of that forest, if you added up all the health benefits for the people living around here, this is just next to a town where I live, the health benefits probably outweigh the value of the timber uh, many, many times, but maybe nobody's sort of bothered about looking into it. Yeah, so you got sort of the, the classic way of doing uh, economics now. Uh, so you, so the, the economy is sort of everything. And then we are sort of part of, humanity is part of economy. And then the 
environment is sort of this little thing. I remember in the 1980s, there was this politician. I mean, this is way we, we this is way we, we, yeah, this is uh, the way we deal with economics uh, today. In the 1980s, we, uh, I remember a politician, I think he was conservative, I've never been able to find the quote, but it was so fantastic. He said, we need economic growth because then we will generate more money we can use on the environment. So we're going to exploit nature, <laughs> earn a lot of money, and then we're going to put a band-aid on it afterwards. Um, so then you've got something called uh, ecological economics. And of course, you can't sort of go from one to the other sort of overnight. Um, but that is more sort of like holistic in its approach. You say, okay, we've got an environment that supports humanity. And of course, lots of other <laughs> good stuff, all the species out there. And that supports our economy. So sort of looking at it in a different perspective. This is Denmark now. It pays off more to put solar does to farm the land um so here are about to build up it's a several hundred uh, football fields she's gonna end up with uh on an s and deep ecology should probably mention a guy called uh, george session who was uh, also involved in this in the 1970s but he compared shallow ecology um to something he called deep ecology and shallow ecologies are anthropocentric everything has to do with me and my needs or your needs nature is only of value if it serves human interest nature has instrumental value you would say and then you got the deep ecologists they claim that all living things have the same right to live and flourish so he was often criticized sort of de to uh, devalue humans, but what he actually meant was that we have to raise the value of all living species. Um, I've got a dog and uh, he's pretty happy with his life. He's got purpose somehow. I think a lot of you have got a pet at home and you would argue that that pet has value. So he would do the same with other species. Of course, some species are closer to us than others. So that he, he was pragmatic. So he's not sort of sort of totally <laughs> square about things, but but um, you just have to start value species more. But, yeah, so you could say that nature has intrinsic value. It has a value even if we can't make use of it. Yeah, and they typically reject anthropocentrism in favor of biocentrism or ecocentrism. So the main point you could say is that you shouldn't exploit nature less it is to ful um, fulfill vital needs for us. But what vital needs are for us, that is a bit hard to define and they were a bit vague on purpose. Yeah, that was that. We're gonna skip that and we're gonna skip that. <laughs> but vital need with this uh, if everybody on the planet earth lived as norwegians you've seen this lots of times we will need three and a half planet earths so this is also something we need to consider when we when we plan for the future that what, the way we live here in norway is not sustainable so what we think are vital needs in our everyday life is it really vital it's not up to me to, <laughs> to define, but um, yeah. So we strolled a little bit out of the forest at the end there, took a trip to the universe, but um, I would just say thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. Five minutes to questions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can see, yeah, we already have some hands up, so we could take a few points from the online group and we have any questions coming from the chat, we can try to take one. And then if there's any, if, if we have the time uh, from the audience, and if not afterwards, we can also have a chat with Nika. Yeah. So I don't know, uh, between raise their hand first, but yeah, go ahead, either of you. <laughs> Uh, do we need to do something here to get sound or? Uh, let's just try with Vitaly. Is it frozen? No? Yeah. If you could remove the screen sharing, I think we could see each other then better. 
There we go. Maybe yes. yes. Hi. Thank you so much for your presentation. It's just great. And I think everyone should listen it. I think it's highly depressing because I am in nature conservation and what you say. Do you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. 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 I'm in nature conservation. And what you are talking, I was listening since 2016. So now it's seven years. So how do we get there? I think it's, you know, from my perspective, it's not that people don't understand what is happening. Everyone understands because it's visible <clears throat> in, if people look, it's visible in the garden, it's visible in the home, it's visible everywhere. Yeah. And still we continue to go on this Serrano way. Uh, yeah, I, I wrote another book. <laughs> That's uh, unfortunately it's only in Norwegian, but um, I would have went a little bit into that because I don't think we humans are necessarily evil or are trying to do uh, anything inherently bad. The problem is that we were um, we were evolving in a completely different environment, living completely different than what we are now. We were living in small groups, and um, if I took a bit uh, a larger share of the cake than uh, what I was supposed to do, to put it that way, then uh, I would hear it from, uh, from uh, my fellow uh, tribe members. So, so we had sort of this uh, self-regulating small societies and the tribes. But nowadays, if I take, but for once, we, the, that cake seems infinitely big now. That's one problem that we think it is very, very big. It's not, um, with it, there's no limits. That's one thing. And if I grab a very big piece of that, um, that uh, cake, nobody's going to stop me. So we've sort of lost, we've lost all these sort of regulating um, aspects like that. And we're also sort of wired to, to accumulate things. Um, and um, we've got different ways of impress people. Um, I mean, I'm a poor guy, so I can't impress people with big cars and uh, houses and what those, but I can maybe I can start and chat and stuff like that. So a lot of what we do is about impressing others, even if it is sort of subconscious. So we got lots of, we got a sort of, we got a stone age mind, you could say, in the modern world. And that makes it very, and also a, a society that sort of, um, that really hasn't any way of limiting us. We don't want to be limited. And then we end up in these uh, situations where everybody's maybe live more unsustainable than we, we should. Yeah, thank you. I think there's some kind of dialoguing needed, deep dialoguing, you know, because I was myself, I'm a researcher and I'm in, in, in science dissemination. We've been producing data and disseminating data. And it freezes people. It's surely like your screen was frozen, you know, for some time. You feel just, you are in this system. I am in this system, you know, if, and we are all contributing to this, what is happening in one or other way. No one is innocent, you know. We come back with our kids back home and we buy tablets and we continue, you know, contributing to mining and all these practices that erase forests from the earth. And I think it's really, yeah, about know how we get together how we, we move together because it's not work of one person and it's not about being informed the reason why i would like to come here is that i think this is the solution i think dialogue and making hubs like this and hopefully see it grow is the only way there's not going to come anyone from the top uh, i mean here in norway we sort of they, they wait for the new church and it's going to tell us what to do uh, we're in an emergency, but he's not going to come or she's not going to come. It's going to come from here. Yeah, thank you so much for and doing this work. Uh, what you are doing, we can't sit down and wait. We just have to start doing things and then slowly things will change, hopefully, hopefully quickly. <laughs> so, yeah, just looking at the time, uh, Marie, if uh, you have a quick uh, question so that we can wrap up, we're just one minute over time. So, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to say the story. I'm from Czechia, where we have the history. Uh, in communism, they fell down all the forests and uh, grew spruce monocultures. 
just to explain why spruce uh, because it's the fastest yeah. growing tree uh, which is used in building industry or major in, in building industry. Yeah. And so so all these forests were like this, but the uh, spruce is not which you know obviously uh, spruce, spruce is not built to grow in monocultures. So no. uh, so recently with this climate change, we started uh, getting uh, like more and more of these disasters like orcans, uh, forest fires, uh, and we have that uh, bug. I I don't know how you call it. It uh, lives under the bark. Bark beetle. Bark beetle. Bark yeah. Beetle. Yeah, okay. insect outbreaks. And that is that is really overpopulated. Yeah. And uh, this is a great actually uh, time for ecologists because we started renewing our forest. Mm -hmm. Like before, there was big pressure from uh, the forest industry against it. Uh, however, they actually started realizing that this all these disasters, they started losing of the forests and these disasters are coming more yeah. and more often that they actually serve the ecology because of, because these mm. forests are now renewed or getting yeah, renewed it will take long time <laughs> we haven't gotten that far in norway yet but the the, the issue is that I, I didn't talk about that but a very homogeneous forest is also a very fragile forest because the ecosystem is out of balance so if you had lots of different species, also tree species, different ages, you got a more complete ecosystem. So if you get a drought, drought, I think it's called not drought, <laughs> turkey, um, then you uh, you might get uh, bark beetles in a more natural forest too. But you also got all the predators and parasites that can keep the population in check. So you won't get this is, you might get sort of local outbreaks, but you won't get these enormous outbreaks that you get in uh, the plantations. And I think we're starting to see the forest industry and always see that it's not maybe, I mean, when you plant a tree today, it, ha it has to stand there for 80 years. And then the temperature might be two or three degrees warmer than it is now on average. It's not suitable for a pine, I mean, a spruce tree. Mm. So lots of interesting things that we could have talked about, but a very good point that I should have mentioned. Yeah, it took 20 years of discussion when people realized that uh, they actually have to give up on monocultures uh, because uh, because uh, it is the disasters are worse and everything is coming worse. Okay, uh, we're this will be the call, the end of the call online. Uh, oh, there's someone trying to say something. I can't. We can't hear you, Ella. Okay, well, we're gonna sign off from uh, from the hub uh, over here. We're gonna, yeah, we have a program to continue. Uh, so thank you so much for attending and uh, yeah, have a great rest of your session. Bye.